नमो तगवत अर्हत संबुद मे ऑल द बुद्धस एंड बुद्धि सत्वस देवास एंड नागस सेंस एंड सेजेस मे ऑल द डिवाइन बींग्स एंड डिवाइन पावर्स फ्रॉम ऑल द डायरेक्शन ऑफ द यूनिवर्स may kindly look at us and shower their blessings upon all of us for the success of our coming together in this beautiful dhamma hall of the buddhist gem fellowship of malaysia very very good evening to all of you and when i say good evening i mean it not the casual one you keep on saying good morning good afternoon good evening it doesn't mean often or sometimes with a big artificial smiling face you say hello good morning hello good afternoon good bye and in the mind you say go to hell <laughs> right so i don't mean that when i say good evening i mean it because the evening is very good isn't it i am feeling very good here in this beautiful dharma hall we have gathered here to think about buddha think of dharma think of our sangha and how to progress on the path of dharma and attain enlightenment and there is nothing higher greater nobler superior than enlightenment in the whole universe we are sitting so quietly so comfortably so peacefully within the air conditioned room If you cannot feel good then where you can feel good I am feeling good I hope you are also feeling good If someone is not feeling good then something is wrong and we need to check it Maybe call it psychiatrist or something I say <laughs> I am asking once again are you feeling good Yes mm. There is no reason why you cannot feel in place like this in a time like this Yet some of you can manage not feeling good that is not because of the present moment it is because of your failure to live in the present moment my dear the present moment is a wonderful there is no problem absolutely no problem in the present moment yet some people can be a bundle of problems that is not because of this beautiful center the buddhist gem fellowship it's not because of the beautiful hall it's not because of the beautiful stupa it is not because of this ugly old monk here it is because of your failure to live in the present moment your body is in the present moment your mind is always the same following the monkey mind like jumping from past to future future to past from there to here not able to keep the mind in the present moment if you keep your mind in the present moment the present moment is really beautiful particularly in this place yes are you feeling it thank you whether you are feeling good or not whether you feeling or ha- feeling happy or not happy how i will know it how i will know it my dears there is a way that i can know it if you are smiling that means you are happy if you are not smiling you are not happy yeah smiling is worth of millions of dollars but we do not charge any money for your smile so don't be miserly in smiling and smiling is a special gift given to only human beings only human beings are blessed with the ability to smile my dears not buffaloes not donkeys have you seen any buffaloes donkeys smiling sometimes they do looking towards sky they do something strange thing that is not the smiling they are doing something else so only human beings are blessed with the ability to smile it and smiling is so beautiful when you are smiling you create a wonderful atmosphere around you a friendly atmosphere a relaxed atmosphere a lovely atmosphere if you are not smiling you have a long face you are creating a tension around you difficult around you so please don't forget to make use of the special divine gift given to you smiling smile and smile smile and smile 
When you are genuinely smiling from your heart, there is no tension, there is no stress, there is no problem. Smiling and tension and stress cannot live together. Light and darkness cannot live together. When light comes, darkness must run away. When smiling comes, all your stress, tension in the body must run away. Isn't it? Smile. Even then you seem to be difficulties, I still not, not, am not able to see a nice smile. <laughs> Do please some, some smiling yoga, smiling exercise. Yeah, there is a saying, my dears, one apple a day keeps the doctors away. I would like to see a continuous smiling keeps the doctors away continuously. Smiling is one of the best medicine for the sickness of the 21st centuries, my dears. Learn to smile, okay? So I would like you to sit, relax, peacefully, happily peacefully, happily, smilingly, okay? You may have many reasons not to smile when you leave this hall. But in this hall, nobody is creating problem for you. Every bit of this hall has been carefully created to make you smile, to make you happy. You cannot find any excuse in this hall not to be happy, not to smile. Once you leave the hall and go back home, oh, then you will find thousand and one. I want to be happy but my wife. <laughs> I want to be happy but my husband. I want to be happy but my neighbor. I want to be happy but my boss. I want to be happy but, 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 but here no but. Please take off your but. <laughs> Keep it aside. As you have left your shoe outside, isn't it? You left your shoe outside. After this program, you are going to use the shoe again. So, once the program finished, when you go out, you can pick up all your problems. <laughs> but while you are here, at least for the short moment, forget all problems. Forget all problem, forget the past, forget the future, forget all things and be in the present moment like a beautiful small baby. Have you seen the baby? So lovely. Also, whenever you have some problem, difficulties, go and catch all of the baby. <laughs> much of a problem will go away. I do this. Too much problem. I go to the boys hostel, girl hostel, just play a little bit with these children to get extend the problem, <laughs> reduce. Because, because there is a similarities, very similarities between this baby and this enlightenment, the Buddhas. Very similar. The only difference is that Buddha is totally conscious, totally conscious, the baby is unconscious. Only that much different. Otherwise, many similarities. The baby also have no ego, the baby also have no idea of your past, your future, your business, your which country you belong to, which religion you belong to, which racism belongs to. They don't have anything. They get, need a little bit of milk food, uh, enjoying, taking breath it properly. We don't know, even know how to breathe properly. You have to learn from babies. The babies know how to breathe properly. Have you seen when the babies are breathing? The belly rise, belly fall down. When you take breath, your belly is not happening. Because you don't take enough breath. You take only half with the chest here. That's why when the yoga you are taught pr pranayama. When you do the pranayama, pranayama means taking the, this, the required amount of breathing. If you take the required amount of breathings, for sometimes, immediately you will feel relaxation, immediately, you try, isn't it? So a lot of things to learn from the babies. <laughs> so be a, like a baby here, forget all your everything and be here at what a wonderful. You can get the glimpse of enlightenment, isn't it? What is enlightenment? I have been talking too much about enlightenment, bodhisattvas, I, I think I, I'm contradicting with many of your teachers. 
the traditional way of teachings here. But if you do go deep enough, there's no contradiction. What is enlightenment? Enlightenment doesn't mean that after some time you will start growing a horn here. <laughs> so that you can say, look, I'm enlightenment. Can't you see that I'm growing the horn of enlightenment? There is no such things. I heard a beautiful Zen story. There was an enlightened Zen master. Someone went and asked him, hello, great master, enlightened master. What you were doing before becoming enlightened? The Zen master, before enlightenment, I was sleeping when I feel sleepy. Before I become enlightenment, if I feel hungry, I eat food. Before I become enlightenment, if I feel thirsty, I drink water. Before I become enlightenment, if I require water, I go and fetch water from the river. And what I do? What do you do after the enlightenment? After the enlightenment, if I feel hungry, I'll eat. After enlightenment, if I feel thirsty, I drink the water. After enlightenment, if I feel sleepy, I sleep. After enlightenment, if I need water, I go and fetch water from the rivers. The same answer. Then what is the difference? The difference is just awareness, awakened. Before enlightenment, you have your own ego. I am. I am. Ego, you know. I, my, I, my. Attachment, clinging, this, that. After enlightenment, same person, only the, the attachment is gone. The ego is gone. Self-centered is gone. I am. The biggest wall between you and enlightenment, between you and Buddha, is the biggest chana wall between you and Buddha, is the ego. I am. Absence of I is the presence of Buddha. Pers absence of I is the presence of enlightenment. We do experience this sometimes, but not aware. When you are here, totally in the present moment, no I, just simply living like the baby, like a flower in the garden, you are almost reaching to that state. And somehow, 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 if you become little aware, even for a few seconds, and that second can become one minute, that one minute can become two minutes, that two minutes can become 10 minutes, 20 minutes. A time will come, a day will come, 24 hours you are enlightened. Isn't it? And that is possible, my dear friends. So try to experience some glimpse here by, uh, by putting aside all the things which we carry. We are carrying the whole world, the globe in our head, my dear. The, our head looks small, but we carry bigger than the universe, yeah. Is it possible for you to put aside, live without the head, just with the heart? Yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I must say, I'm so, so happy to visit your beautiful country, Malaysia, after quite some time. Before COVID, 19 pandemic erupted. I was planning to come with the group of my youth groups. We have almost booked the flights. <laughs> then our, what is it, the friend, the guest came, the, known as the COVID pandemic, <laughs> COVID-19 pandemic came and paralyzed the whole world. So we had to cancel it. Yeah. And last year, after the, immediately after the COVID pandemic, again we tried to come, but there was, you know, a few years, all the embassies were closed. Few years people cannot move from one country to another countries. And then yes, last year, well, hundreds and thousands of people queue up at all the embassies. To go to United States, you have to wait one year or two years <laughs> to get visa for United States. One year, two years. So all the embassy were packed and we were a little bit late in applying the visa, got delayed, then we had to cancel again. 
and we are all fortunate. We, we have been able to fight and conquer this ghostly COVID pandemic. We are again here meeting. We feel so happy now this time to come again along with our youth groups here. We like to express our profound appreciations to Nalanda, who have invited our youth group for the Youth Exchange Program. We also like to express our thanks to so many wonderful Malaysian friends, our brothers, Charlie Chia, Siring Tundup. We have given him, where is brother Charlie? <laughs> ah, <laughs> we have given him the name, Ladakhi name, Siring Tundup. Very carefully, there is a big meaning behind giving this name. Siring means long life, Tundup means Siddhartha, wish fulfiller. Why we have given this long life and wish fulfiller? I have initiated so many projects in Ladakh. I'm good in dreaming the dreaming for projects. And who will fulfill? Sering Tundu will fulfill. <laughs> That's why we told them that <laughs> brother, brother Charlie will have this name and he will live as long as uh, until all the projects of Mahabud is completed. <laughs> to fulfill the wishes of Mahabodhi MIMC. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Charlie. We are here. Today we, have, we are enjoying such a wonderful Dhamma friendship with so many hundreds and thousands of wonderful Malaysian people. This would have not happened without Brother Charlie. In 1991, I took up the first traveling journey outside India. I went to South Thailand to attend the 84th birthday of Achan Buddha Dasa. From there, I just came down to Malaysia. Don't know, I don't know how I managed to get the visa. I also don't remember. It was no less than a miracle. I never planned, had no money, no plan. But somehow I landed in Kuala Lumpur. Somebody took me to Brickfield Vihara. <coughs> there I met Brother Charlie. I met many people. During my traveling, oh, I keep on meeting hundreds and thousands of people. We meet and exchange the name card and say hello. hello. And nowadays, uh, exchange a few messages on WhatsApp. Then forget, finish. But Brother Charlie remained uh, so closely associated. He started bringing wonderful groups of friends from Malaysia year after year after year and brought wonderful people and they all started supporting our projects. Today, we are enjoying such a wonderful Dhamma friendship between the most ancient Buddhist land in the high Himalaya, Ladakh, Ladakh known as the roof of the world, Ladakh known as the last Shangri-La, Ladakh known as the land of three M's, the land of monks, monasteries, mountain. That's what you will see. Wherever you turn your eyes, you will see either mountains or monasteries or some monks, lamas. Other than these three, you will not see anything. Yeah, Ladakh is known as the land of high passes. Ladakh is known as the broken moon. Ladakh is known as the land between the heaven and earth, right? And the relationship with such an ancient Buddhist land in the high Himalaya with the most modern city of Kuala Lumpur, the city of Twin Towers. Isn't it something wonderful relationship? So much to share with each other, so much to learn from each other. Thanks. I also like to thank Dr. Victor V. Datuk Dr. Victor V. Also wonderful friend of us, great supporter of us. He also brought so many groups, you know, 
and his, much of his songs are sung by our students here in Ladakh. Yeah. So thanks. We are missing him so much today. We are missing Dr. Victor here. But anyway, others are there. Our present, current president, president of BJP is there representing Dr. Victor V. And I'm looking forward to meet him before I will leave here. And all the BJP members. And Sister Elaine's, Elaine's is here? Ela Elaine's. She huh? She has some appointment. Appointment. <laughs> yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much inviting us here this evening to have this uh, precious time together, praying together, meditating together, and sharing one, some words of Dhamma with each together. It's a wonderful um, moment for, for all of us. And uh, we pray and hope. Our friendship, Dharma friendship between the Ladakh and the Malaysia will continue to grow. And uh, the ancient Buddhist land in Ladakh represents a profound devotion, faith. Right? Faith, devotion, very important. And your Malaysian Buddhist represents the the intellectual part, the knowledge part of Buddhism. They must go together, study. Important to have faith. Faith is important, but not enough. But without faith, nothing can happen, my dears. Faith is the foundation of spirituality. Wonderful. There is a saying, faith can sh shake the mountains. There's a beautiful story in Tibetan Buddhism about faith, how faith can work. I want to share that. Uh, ancient time, many Buddhists from Ladakh used to go to Tibet for trade kind of, pilgrims also trade kind of trade. And there was one very pious Buddhist family, the, particularly the old mother was very religious, very pious. His son was going to Tibet every year for some business. And his mother told his son, my dear son, I'm getting old. Before I die, I want to see and worship, pray a Buddha relics. Can you bring a Buddha relics from Tibet? Tibet in the Himalayas is considered the Vatican, Buddhist Vatican. Dalai Lama is like Pope. Everybody in Himalaya have a strong wish to go to Tibet, to have a glimpse of Dalai Lama. So his son says, yes, my dear mother, I will bring. He promised to bring. He went to Tibet and his business was so successful. He forgotten. When the business is successful, who cares for Buddha? Who cares for Buddha relics? Who cares for a mother? Business is successful. <laughs> so he came back and the mother asked, my dear son, have you brought the Buddha relics? Oh, I'm so sorry, my dear mother, I've forgotten. Next year, certainly I will bring. Definitely I will bring next. Next year came. Again, the mother said, my dear son, I'm getting old before I die. I do not know when I will die. Before I die, I want to see the Buddha relics. I want to worship the Buddha relics. This time, please do not forget. Yes, my dear mother, this time, suddenly I will not forget. I will bring. When with the pro promise, when he arrived in Tibet, Lhasa, his business was so successful, better than last year, again forgotten. When the business is so successful, who cares about Buddha? Who cares about Buddha really? Who cares about mother? Business. He came back and a mother asked, my dear son, have you brought? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. The business was so successful. I'm forgotten. Please forgive me, mother. Next year, definitely I will bring. Next year came. 
before he left the mother again said, my dear son, I'm getting very old, do not know when I will die. Before I die, I want to see the Buddha relics, want to worship the Buddha relics. This time, please do not forget. Yes, my dear mother, this time I promise. When I arrive in Tibet, the first thing I will collect Buddha relics before I start the business. I will never come without, without, without Buddha relics. With this promise, mother, we, son went to Tibet. When he arrived in Lhasa, the business was so successful, much better than last two years. Again forgotten. When the business is so successful, who cares about Buddha and who cares about God, who cares about Dharma, who cares about mother? Lost in business. I'm sorry, all business people are not like this. There are some business people. <laughs> I don't mean to insult any business people here. <laughs> You are different business people, my dears, otherwise you won't be here. <laughs> so, now, again forgotten. On the way, just few kilometers, reaching back home, the son remembered, oh my God. Now again I forgotten. Now I promised my mother that first I will collect Buddha relics before I start my business. Now I cannot show my face. How can I show my face? What shall I tell to my mother? So he started thinking, what shall I do? Shall I shall? Businessman is a businessman. He, when, when he was thinking and walking on the footpath, he suddenly saw a very old white color scalp, dog scalp. Dog scalp. So business, businessman, businessman always th thinking of cheating, deceiving. He said, oh. How about if I, if I break and take out one teeth from this, uh, the white skull of a dog, and I wrap up in a nice cloth and carry in my head and tell my mother, it is the pure relics of Buddha. It's, teeth, it's the Buddha's teeth. This is the only way I can sh now go back home and show my face, otherwise I cannot go. Thus, he took up this uh, white skull of dog, put on a stone, broke, take out one teeth of a uh, dog and wrap up in nice clothes and carry it in his head. As you carry Buddha relics here, no? <laughs> carry it. And the, when the, he reached the home, the mother from, from far distant saw that his son is carrying something on his head. That must be the Buddha relics. The mother rushed. My dear son, is that the Buddha relics you are carrying on it? Yes, mother, yes, yes. And then mother said, oh, thank you so much, my dear son. This time you have forgotten. How I can, for, how I can forget, mother, I love you. I love you. Have I not promised that this time I am not going to start my business before collecting with it? This is the purest Buddha relics. relics. It was difficult, mother. Very difficult. It took so, so many days to collect it. But I never bothered to start the business without collecting the Buddha relics. This pure Buddha relics. Take it. The mother carried it on your head. Tears coming from her eyes. Put them to the altar and she, with such a faith and devotion, he started praying. Praying, praying, praying. Now after some time, when he opened her eyes, light was coming out. Light was coming out from the teeth. There's a famous saying, you know, when you have faith, light, even the teeth, teeth of a dog can represent the teeth of the Buddha. If you have a faith, my dears, even an ordinary stupid monk like me can represent Buddhas and your work can be done miraculously. If you have no faith, the Buddha may be there. You're sitting with the Buddha, you will miss it. Miss. At the time of Buddha, do you know? Thousands of people, just few, few meters from Buddha, they lived this many years. They couldn't benefit. Thousands of people were coming from thousands of kilometers. And after listening one discourse, after listening two discourse, after one day, two days, three days, hundreds of people were becoming Sotapanna, Sagadagami, Anagami, Aran. They have faith. Without faith, nothing will work. But with the faith, also, also studying, 
also intellectual, also in. Based on the strong faith, we must investigate Dhamma. We must study the Dhamma. Faith is important, not enough. Faith is your feet, I is your wisdom. Then only you can move. You may have faith, but no wisdom, you cannot move, you can't see it. You may have a knowledge, no faith, uh, no leg, no leg, you cannot. So in order to walk safely, you need to have a strong feet, a strong eye, then you can move. So our Buddhists in Ladakh represent the feet, the foundation of Buddhism. You fellows represent the wisdom, the knowledge of Dhamma. Correct? What a wonderful to work together. Even if one doesn't have eyes, one doesn't have like they can help each other. The one who I have eyes can hold the other one. And one who doesn't have the leg and the uh, the leg, the, those who have eyes can carry, can help each other. This is the relation we wish to have, my dears, between the Buddhists of Ladakh and Buddhists of a uh, most modern city, Malaysia, Singapore. I want all Malaysians to come every year, at least two, three groups. Please, next summer, our Honorable President of BJP, please organize one group. Yes, either uh, with uh, Victor V or Charlie or together. And I will bring every year one group from Himalayas. <laughs> right? So wonderful to see you, friends. And uh, I think I often forget uh, the theme of my talk. Last two days, I think my theme was in same compassion and action. When I finish my talk, I remember the, my theme of talk. <laughs> I think to, tonight also the theme I'm supposed to uh, speak on compassion in action. Yes, this is important. Friends, Karuna, Maitri, Ahimsa, Dhyana, all these words are not new for us. We have heard many times. We have read many times. All these things will have no meaning, absolutely will have no meaning unless and until we put in actions. It is action matters alone. It is action. Putting in action brings result. Otherwise it remains just the information as a knowledge. Yeah? So just mere knowledge is not enough. Just mere information is not enough. But we must put in actions. Now is the time to put the teachings of Buddha in action. Now is the time to put the compassion in action. Why we have taken up especially the com compassion in action program? Because so much unjust, unjust, unfair, violence, war, aggressions, exploitations are going in all around the world. If you look carefully, it's an absence of compassion in action. If all the people of the world, even 10%, 20%, 30% compassion, understand and practice the compassion, the world will be different. There will not be so inhuman, brutal killing, brutal wars taking place in different parts of the world. The whole world is burning with hatred, with anger, with killings, my dears. So to me, it looks the only panacea, the only medicine for the ill of this 21st century is the great medicine known as Mahakaruna, the great compassion in action. That's how, you know, the, uh, the 
motto of our organization is compassion in action, meditation in action. Also, meditation also has to be understood. Meditation doesn't mean with cr sitting in cross leg with closed eyes. <clears throat> yes, initially we all have to sit comfortably and learn. Then, slowly, slowly, the same meditation which you experience in sitting must be brought into all forms of life, all activities. Whether you are walking in an office, driving a car, cooking a food, cleaning a house, whatever you are doing, that state of mindfulness, that awareness, that quietness, that peacefulness, you experience in sitting meditation. Obviously, you cannot spend the whole 24 hours with closed eyes, isn't it? So therefore, uh, we have carefully thought of our motto of our organization, compassion in action, meditation in action. Friends, what we are doing under the theme, compassion in action, meditation in action, how it started, if time permits, I like to go back uh, how I started the whole uh, organization in Lada. I was born and brought up in a traditional Buddhist family and later on after serving few years in Indian Army I left and went to South India to the Mahabuddhist Society in Bangalore to become a monk and I was trained there as a monk in a traditional Buddhist way. So after uh, completing my basic studies and, and the uh, monastic training, I moved back to Ladakh in 1986. I rented a small house, very small house, you cannot sit more than three, four people. Just four walls with a small window. <laughs> yes. There, again I started uh, uh, teaching some Dhamma in the traditional Buddhist way. What is the traditional Buddhist way? Usually, in the traditionally, the monks, the teacher will say, world is suffering, world is maya, renounce world, world, everything is suffering. You know, jati vi dukha, jara vi dukha, vayadi vi dukha, maranam pi dukha, yam pi cha, nala pi tam pi dukha, you are suffering, I am suffering, she is suffering, he is suffering, you are suffering, all are suffering. Suffering, suffering, suffering. Renounce the world, renounce the world, renounce the world. I started talking like this. Then I soon realized this kind of the high philosophical teachings of Buddha going so deep about the for children who are five years, six, seven years, ten years, you're teaching about death, old age. It doesn't, it doesn't appeal to the children. You know, it's not their priority. Children need something else before they grow old, before they die. I realize the high philosophical teachings of Buddha different level of meditation, samadhi, other different uh, jhanas, the 32 planes of existence, the tushita heaven, tawatimsa heaven, this and that and that, high level thinking, high philosophy, the abhidhamma, 89 consciousness, you know, 89, 89 different consciousness. Chitta, chitta divided to 89. Chitta, the mind. Isn't it? I realized these are not priority for everybody. I realized for the poor children, their top priority is to have some hostel and school where they can live in the hostel and go to school and learn something which can help them to stand on their own feet later on. With the help of education, they may become self reliant or they will be protected from all kinds of exploitations. I realized that. And I also realized for the sick people, 
the top priority was not again the high philosophical teachings of Buddha. For the sick people, the top priority was the doctor's medicine hospital. For the homeless people, their top priority was not again the high philosophical teachings of yoga, meditation, nirvana, different stages of samadhi and the different uh, jhanas and all these things. Their top priority was to have a home, the elderly homeless people, have a four wall home. They can be protected from the severe cold of winter where temperature is going minus 20, 30, 40. I realized that. Then I also realized that the best religion for the hungry is the food. The best religion for the thirsty is water. The best religion for the sick is the doctor's medicine hospital, not the Buddha and his philosophy. When somebody is physically sick, don't take him to Buddha. You take him to doctor. Buddha himself has the doctor. Dalai Lama is taking all the ten, three, four doctors together, all the time. When he comes, Dalai Lama comes to Ladakh, all the top doctors, three, four doctors, always, always came at Dalai Lama's residence. What does it mean? Dalai Lama may be great, but body belongs to the earth. You know? And Buddha have his own physician. There was a blind person at the time of Buddha. The blind person doesn't believe the existence of light. And some fellows try to uh, convince him the existence of light. The blind fellow started arguing, you fellows are blind. I'm not, I'm, I'm not blind, you are blind. If you say the light is this, come on, let me touch the light. Come on, let me test the light. Come on, let me smell the, smell the light. Now light is something, my dear, you cannot touch, you cannot taste, you cannot smell. And this argue, and these people fail in the argue, arguing with this man. And one day, these fellows thought, no, nobody can convince this fellow. <laughs> if at all, if, you know, if anyone can convince that is Buddha, why don't you take these idiots, the blind men, to the Buddha? At least the Buddha will convince him. They took him to the Buddha. And Buddha, you know what he said? You, you said, you are fools. He don't need the Buddha, he need the eye surgeon. <laughs> Take him to a Jivaka doctor, whether he can, he can do something. Not to bring, don't bring such to me. Take him to the doctor. A doctor did so. And he, he, the, the story says that the operation was successful and he, that fellow got the light, uh, eye back. Isn't that? So is it. Then I thought, Wow, if I can, let me look for a piece of land where if I can think of starting a school, hostel for these poor children from these remote villages, inaccessible, remote villages between the high mountains of Himalaya, sharing the border with China and Pakistan. Let me think of uh, starting a school. Let me think of starting an old age home for the homeless people. Let me think of starting a hospital for the sick people. So thus I started looking for the land. But that time also I have not forgotten. I said, if I succeed, I will like to have a beautiful meditation center also for the Malaysians. Malaysian means those have everything now. High level of teachings, how many jhanas are there? How many samadhis are there? How many planes of existence are there? How many types of nirvana are there for Malaysians? Who have good house, good food, good cloth, good education. You Malaysians are, need that. Not those people, those poor children in different parts of India, those homeless people, they first need the basic things. You can't teach meditation to an empty stomach person. Bring an empty stomach and ask him, keep your back erect, close your eyes. Cannot keep the back erect, there's no strength. Cannot ask him to close your eyes, look for a Buddha. 
Well, initially, he may manage to have a glimpse of Buddha, and slowly, what will happen, do you know? Slowly, the image of Buddha will turn into a bread. <laughs> he needs bread, not the Buddha. Give him bread. Fast. Give him cloth. Give him a basic food. When his stomach is full, ah, that is the time to think something higher than food. Higher than that. Yeah, we also do funny things. We keep on teaching poor people, renounce, renounce. What renounce? You should have something to renounce. Before you renounce, you should have something. Renunciation, formulations. <laughs> Not for those poor, poor people have nothing. Don't have a basic home. Don't have enough clothes to wear. Don't enough have good food, medicine, hospital, school, the basic group. What do you renounce? Isn't it? Renunciation, formulations. <laughs> and the re you have to understand that renunciation also doesn't mean renouncing, giving up home and this and that. The real renunciation is renunciation of your ego, renunciation of a false view, wrong views, renunciation of clinging, attachment, not having, not having a too much attachment, clinging ego. This, these are the real renunciation. The others, other, no, just renounce your home and build bigger than your home in the monasteries. That, I don't know, is a renunciation. Isn't it? Have you seen it sometimes, in, sorry to say, in some traditional Buddhist country? They say, I have renounced the home. Yeah, wow. The home was so small. Now <laughs> build like a palace of temple. Live in a palace. And they talk about renunciation. That doesn't convince me what is real renunciation. Renunciation of greed. Renunciation of hatred, renunciation of ignorance, renunciation of all the false view we have. We all have false view. I am this, that, this, that. Renouncing that. And for that to have study, understand, and this. So this is how I look for the land, piece of land, my dear. And there was no problem to get the land that time. Outside lay, we found the land, and fortunately I was able to... Uh, uh, see a little bit of future. Maybe, who knows? Who knows one day I may meet, meet good people. Maybe I get support. So we should go for bigger land. <laughs> and people thought crazy. I have gone crazy. At that time, the Mahabudi campus was considered very far from Lay City. It was considered part of the far of mountains. And there was no road, no drop of water, no blade of grass, no money, nothing, not one dollar in my pocket. Wow, we went there and we uh, we, we I managed to invite some guests from Korea and uh, Thailand and have a foundation lying ceremony for foundation. And that time, one the Japanese monk Nakamura, who built this Japanese stupa, who happened to be there with the drum, you know, the Japanese monk with the small drum, go on re beating the drum and reciting Nam Yo Ho Reng Yo Kyo. He was there. I was very happy that he is also there to bless. And before he left, he said something strange. He said, "You will not be successful in your project." I was annoyed. I said, why? This four, number four, is inauspicious. Not good. <laughs> wow. You know, in, I think in our, your society of Chinese, Chinese tradition also, certain numbers are in, considered inauspicious. You go to a, some hotel somewhere, one, two, three, four, one number suddenly missing. <laughs> yes, so the Japanese, for the Japanese, the four number is very bad, inauspicious. He said, then I, uh, I was not happy. I really wanted to um, debate with him. 
And I scratched my head, what should they say? And said, when they will come here, for us, the four number is four noble truth. <laughs> four noble truth. The entire teachings of Buddha depend on the four noble truth. We are dreaming here complete Buddhism, four noble truth. For us, it is four noble truth. You, for you, may be inauspicious. For us, the follower of Buddha, there cannot be more auspicious number than four noble truth. So I argue with him. <laughs> but there was uh, some doubt inside, you know, suspicious, oh, who will help this and that. And people thought that I have been promised a huge amount of donation from Japan. Those days, Japan were considered a very rich Buddhist country, you know. When I told him, I don't know anyone from Japan, America, nobody promised single dollar. And they really thought I have gone crazy to start. So that was a little bit disturbing for me. But deep, deep in my heart, a kind of voice was coming. Sangha Sena, you don't need millions of dollars or rupees to start. What do you need? A piece of paper. Write down on the piece of paper briefly what you want to do here. And if you have 100 rupees, those days, 30 years back, 100 rupees mean 10,000 rupees to today. If you have some 100 rupees, 50 rupees, get it printed in one small leaflet, black and white color. And one day, one day somebody from somewhere will hear your prayer, will hear your prayer. And I followed that. And exactly that happened. Of course, the journey has been full of challenges, tough challenges. But slowly, slowly, I happened to meet good people, one after another, one after another, like Brother Charlie, like Dr. Victor V, like many others. And Charlie brought some wonderful people, Sister Ramon Alai, who supported our big water projects. You know, the journey has been really challenging. But it was worth the number of people who went through all the challenges, difficulties were so small. And today, the number of people who are benefiting, who are benefiting from the organization is gone less. No comparison. Therefore, it is worth sacrificing the smaller number for the cause of bigger numbers. This you call it compassionate action, whatever. Yes, we must understand. The bigger number is more important than smaller number. If we can develop this attitude again, call it Dhamma, wisdom, understanding, attitude, whatever. If you can change this attitude, we always think how the bigger number can help to the smaller number. This is what we think. We never think the, how the Bigger number, bigger number is more important. Others are more important than me. Don't understand. Others go to hell, me important. I am. This is what people think. We have to change this attitude. What is another compassion? Compassion in action is to change this attitude. What, what can you do for me? To, what can I do? for you need to change. What can I get from you to what can I give you? If you can change this, the world would be different. There will not be single starvation. The world would be different. But it is not there. Everybody is me, me, I, 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 more, 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 more. I don't understand. People think by having more and more and more and more you will think happiness. Your happiness, your peace, your contentment, dear friends, does not come from having more material, more than your actual needs. Isn't it? There's a story. One very successful, or I don't know successful, big businessman was driving a very expensive car on the highway. 
he has to go for a, a business meeting. He was driving very fast, 160, 70, 80 kilometers an hour. And on the way, he suddenly saw a young man, a handsome man, a, looks very intelligent, young, healthy, was simply sitting under the tree. Out of curiosity, he stopped the car and went out and said, Oh, young man, what happened to you? He said, nothing happened. Why are you are sitting under the tree? What are you doing? Then he said, then what shall we do, sir? Why don't you go to city? Why? Why should we go to city, sir? Oh, young man, you look intelligent. You don't understand. If you go to city, you can get a job. And the man young again asked, for what, sir? Job for what, sir? He said, oh, you look very intelligent. You don't know that much. If you have a job, you can earn money. And then again asked the young man, for what, sir, the money? Oh, young man, you look intelligent. You don't know that much. If you have money, you can have, buy a big house. You can have a big car. You can have a big sofa. You can have a big furniture. And he said, for what, sir, again? Oh, young man, you're so fully, you look so intelligent, you don't understand. When you have a car, when you have a big house, when you have a sofa, then you can relax. Then the young man said, sir, this is what I'm doing here. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. And this big businessman couldn't understand. He shook his head and turned towards his big car. And the young man shoot it, shoot, uh, you know, from the behind. Sir, sir. Please wait. Sir, I also went through the madness which you are going through, <laughs> madness, he said. And the, the businessman said, for what? What are you talking? What do you mean? Sir, I was also a businessman like you. I also thought if I had a big, big house, bigger house than my neighbor, if I have a car bigger than my friend's car. If I have a position, name and status higher than others, I will be happy. I will be, have contentment. I work hard. As a result, I had a big house, big car, lot of money, lot of furniture, but no peace, no relax. I have a beautiful garden. My gardeners were enjoying the garden more than me. I had a beautiful kitchen and food, but my cook was enjoying more than me. I had a big, wonderful furniture sofa, but my, my maid servants were enjoying more than me. I was so busy attending this meeting, that meeting, this meeting. So finally, I found the real relaxation under this tree. Right? This is a story, friends. Story is story. May, may tr be true, may not be true. Every story has some message that we get. It doesn't mean that from when you go back home tomorrow, stop all your business work. <laughs> huh? Don't go to office, stop this. Give all the house, car to everybody and move and start sitting under the tree. <laughs> the police will come, my dear. What's happened to you? And then you will say, you don't you know that? We don't know that. Yesterday we have great monk coming from Himalaya. He told us such a wonderful stories. The real peace and happiness does not come from the home car and service, no business. I have given up all. Now I am here under the tree. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Police may take you to a, put into a mental hospital. <laughs> and then you realize suddenly, wow, I have such a big house, big car, big... Now I'm landed in mental hospital. How? That stupid monk from Himalaya came. <laughs> so, and you keep on telling, Friends, be careful listening to the talk of these stupid Buddhist monks, particularly that monk from Himalaya. Be careful. 
never go to Himalaya, Ladakh, never see that monk. Dangerous because of him, I am landed in mental hospital. <laughs> yeah, this is a something to think about that. The real peace, real happiness, real harmony, the meaning and purpose of life will not come from the excess, eh? will not come the excess material requirement, also will not come from less than your actual need. Poverty, we are not worshiper of poverty. Poverty is also suffering. The middle way. We all have to work hard, joyfully, happily, as, our, as long as our body and the mind is in good shape, must work hard and happily and keep what you need and the rest give in, the, in charity, share with others. There is more joy in sharing, in giving, than grabbing, than collecting, than accumulating. Isn't it? The heavier the luggage, difficult walk. <laughs> the heavier the weight in the board, the slower move the board. Heavier the weight, more danger of sinking. Lighter the weights in the board, faster it will move. Lighter the weight, is a less chance of sinking. Anything keeping more than our actual requirement can be a source of problem, not the source of happiness, my dears. This has to be understood. Anyway, this is formulation. <laughs> for, 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 for us, for us who don't have this also, poverty. Why wow, you are sick and you don't have money to buy medicine? You are sick, you have no money to pay the medical fees. This is also other extreme. You can't send your children to school who don't, don't have fees to pay. Yeah? Anyway, coming back to the creation of our campus, and today, my dears, that campus becomes so beautiful, it's becoming a unique campus. Unique, it is known as Devachan campus. Devachan, in Tibetan language, means Sukhavati, heavenly world. People ask me, why you have given this Sukhavati? Sukhavati is in heaven. I said, people are so busy and know enough time to think and going to heaven. I brought the Sukhavati down to the earth. <laughs> <laughs> and for many people, for the homeless elderly people, for the lovely children, for the many sick people, for many physically, mentally challenged people, it has become like heaven. Yeah. There are thousands of children, you know, from those remote villages, got high quality education. Today they are, uh, you know, uh, they have many of them created world records. We have beautiful old age home in our standard. And you will find the happiest people in the old age home. You know, these elderly people, then Devachan campus, they have the maximum happiness and minimum requirement. <laughs> Children just opposite. They have the minimum requirement and maximum contentment. Uh, maximum requirement, minimum contentment. Elderly people, so happy. And the children, uh, uh, many of the children had the not come to Mahabudi school and hostel, Mahabudi campus, would have not received education at all. Just to give you an example, one of the lovely girls who lost her parents at the age of four, we came to know, we brought her to our hostels. Uh, she has no brothers, sisters, lost both the father. We gave them the best possible education up to 10th standard. And after 10th standard, I took them to South India. I wanted to give them higher education than 10th standard. But then there was uh, problems, difficulties, challenges. In Ladakh, there is no higher facilities for higher studies. So I wanted to, I thought of taking them to other parts of the country. Bangalore, I knew some people because I live in Bangalore many years. 
but my people didn't agree. Oh, you can't take the girls. First I started you know, the hostel and school for girls. I realized myself, the girls are being left behind. Girls are being neglected. You know, the poor girls even don't know how they have been neglected. They haven't been left. So I personally realized any kind of discrimination between girls and boys is totally unjust, unfair. All the boys and girls must get the equal opportunity for education, for job and everything. But we have strange in many countries, all kinds of beliefs are there. And again, I found it that one of the this main reason for such discrimination is again poverty. If the mother and father have to make a decision to spend certain amount of money for the girl or boy, after scratching the head for a long time, they will decide to spend the money for the boy, not for the girl. Spending money for the boy is considered investment. Spending money for the girl is considered expenditure. <laughs> because one day the girls will go to somebody else's house. And then the father, mother, nicely befool the girl. My dear daughter, we love you. We don't want you to go far away. Let your brother go and study in some other city, village. You know, we want you to stay with us. We love you. And the daughter said, oh, my parents love me. Thank you, mama. Thank you, papa. I would like to stay with you. <laughs> you know, it doesn't know. The whole life, many girls don't know how they have been befooled, you know. So I felt this is totally unfair and unjust. That's why I started the girl hostel first. And then after completing 10th standard, I wanted to take them to Bangalore, but other people don't agree. They say, oh, you can't take this. It's risky. They will get a cultural shock in a big city. Now what to do? One side, I wanted to give them the best possible higher education on the other side. There's a lot of challenges. While I was thinking that way, then one day I found a statement by a very famous Indian Hindu monk, Swami Vivekananda. Some of you might have heard, very famous monk. He said, no great thing can be achieved without involving some risks. All great achievement involve some risk. I told the Swami, thank you, Swamiji. I'm not going to listen to anyone. I'm taking them. I'm taking these risks. I'm taking these challenges, taking them to Bangalore. I took them to Bangalore. But I warned them, be careful. You must follow all the rules, regulations, discipline strictly. They followed, with, they were admitted into some of the renowned good colleges, reputed colleges. They no complaint, they all did excellent. They studied 10 plus 2, then a, a bachelor degree, then master degree, then B.H. Then among them, one girl, these girls, you know, who don't have any parents, brothers, sister. After completing her studies, she decided to look for a job in Bangalore, not to go back to Ladakh, since it doesn't have, she doesn't have any families. She got a job in Infosys, that computers, uh, software companies. And she did so well. After a few years, she was transported to Chicago on promotion as a head of department. Today, she is in Chicago, purchased a house, earning several thousands of dollars. Yeah? And uh, she owns a house from Hundar Dog. Hundar Dog is a remote village in Nubra Valley. Similarly, I, we were the first to start the hostel and school for blind children. Much of the project Mahabudi started is pioneering who have not started. The first non-governmental charitable hospital, the first all -age home, the first hostel school for blind children. We were the first to take up the non-issues, uh, except the Chinese and the Korean traditions, all the, uh, the condition of Buddhist nuns is pathetic. They are not accepted. They are not given the equal respect, support, like the monks, very badly discriminated. I, we were the first to take up this 
We were the first to organize international Buddhist women conference to talk about this. Since then, a lot of things started happening for the development of nuns in Ladakh. So, uh, this, uh, uh, that was also the first time. And we were the first to use submersible pump. We were the first to use deep irrigation. We were the first to bring computer from Singapore to Ladakh. First computer I brought from Singapore in 1991. And I was invited uh, by Upasakas for a, a Chinese restaurant, a Buddhist. And my the friend introduced me, oh, this monk from Ladakh, he, is, he wants to build a school, this and that, something introduced. The owner of the restaurant felt pity on me, said, I want to give something special for this monk. What is the special? He brought the compact computers, American company. And I have no idea what's computer. My friend was trying to explain me, oh, computer, so good, you can type in so nice. I said, please, I cannot do. I cannot. To so many times I cannot. We don't know what is this computer. But he insisted. He insisted, insisted. Finally, I have to say yes. I brought and the Delhi airport, I have to pay huge amount of tax. Those days, of maybe 200% or 300% tax you have to pay. Since the, the, the devotee give with so much affection, love, I don't feel to leave at the airport. I paid all this in two. So I must put that in the museum now. <laughs> yeah. So all Mahabudhi did the pioneering work uh, in, and today that campus has become beautiful. We have a beautiful hostel for girls and boys and old home, the hospital, and we have beautiful meditation center for Malaysians. <laughs> for others, a lot of people during the summertime, mostly Westerners come there, and we have modernized. Uh, uh, simply five, our traditional vipassana system, meditation, uh, dhamma meditation must be, uh, you know, present, must be presented in a simpler way for the newcomers who are not traditional Buddhists. So we have yoga, we have meditation, we have walking meditation, we have a little bit trekking, and all these places, oh, they love, they enjoy. They come with this with suspicious fuss, who oh, it looks like monk, uh, uh, whether they is going to ask us to become a Buddhist. I, I'm interested to learn a meditation, but I don't want to become a Buddhist. They come with the very suspicious. The second day, the third day, are so relaxed, and they want to become Buddhist. <laughs> <laughs> One lady came from Iran. Oh, first day, so suspicious. You know, because everything, a Buddhist, Buddhist, I'm also Buddhist monk. So she was afraid that maybe we will ask her to become a Buddhist. I said, no, you have nothing to do. We are not here to convert you from one organized religion to another organized religion. We don't believe in that kind of conversion, which other, some other religion do it. We believe in the real conversion, conversion from ignorance to wisdom, from darkness to light, <laughs> from bondage to freedom, from samsara to nirvana. That we believe this conversion. <laughs> So we presented the teaching in a very universal way, in a non-sectarian way. Well, third day before she leave, came and said, I want to become Buddhist. I said, no, I will not make you Buddhist. <laughs> no, she insisted, please, please, please. Oh, she went to that extreme. She said, she will become a vegetarian. She will not even take a milk. I, I have not told you. I have not told you to take milk. I, I don't told you to become so strict vegetarian. Why you say, no, 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 I want to. Strict vegetarian. Then I finally have to give a name, Buddhist, uh, becoming Buddhist men. We give a Trisharan Panchashil, and she asked for the name, so I will not give name. No, 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 please. Then I told them, okay, keep it secret. Don't go and tell the Muslim community in Leh that I'm, I have become a Buddhist, I have a Buddhist name, something. So these are the some of the very, you know, uh, very effective uh, teachings programs, meditation program, the way we present today. The meditation center is quite well known. And we are recipient of Prime Minister Yoga Awards, you know, very prestigious award. Our is the first yoga institute in Ladakh recognized by government of India. Today, our organization is very well respected by local government, the government of India, and internationally also. 
and uh, so already has become so beautiful. We have many new projects, so many children. We have here wonderful our girl hostel, Wadan, Madam Miming Bangjet, Madam Jingmet, such a wonderful, compassionate. Uh, she's the head of girl hostel taking care, and she knows so many children like to come and get admission. In the specialty of our school is, uh, in addition to the normal subject, the mathematics, the history and all these things, we emphasize a lot on values, meditation, um, moral uh, education, uh, Buddhist teachings, uh, compassion. Recently we also have introduced, uh, you know, uh, some compassion in education award for the students to promote compassion in education. Modern education requires uh, modifications. Modern education, the general education, is too much head-oriented, too much information-oriented, too much outside-oriented, too much money-making-oriented. It's a head-oriented education, not heart-oriented education. Modern education Somebody said, modern education is not modern education without guided by spiritual values, not only useless but positive, dangerous. Mm -hmm. There is a truth in this, my dears. There is a truth in this. All this, uh, the war going on, the weapons, the destructive weapons they are using in the world, bombs, guns, and the fellows who hijack and hit against, hijack the aeroplane, several aeroplanes and hit against the World Trade Center in New York. Who are these people? These people were not the simple, illiterate people from a remote village. They were highly educated people. They were scientists. They were engineers. They hijack all the aeroplanes. They hit against the World Trade Center. They burn themselves and burn with them thousands of other people. Same, Ukraine, Russia, Palestine and Israel, they are bombing, you know, like rains, uh, killing people. Who are these people? Scientists, highly educated people. Isn't it? Highly educated people. So these highly educated people lacking something, compassion, the spiritual education is not there. So we are trying to introduce compassion in all the universities and colleges in India slowly. Everywhere, all, whether educations and corporates and business and all strongly should be guided by compassion. Otherwise, it will, they will bring more harm than any good to humanities. So in our school where Trump is emphasizing on this, we are trying to provide Edu kind of education to the children in such a way that children grow physically strong, mentally brilliant, culturally rich, spiritually enlightening, materially prosper, environmentally friendly, globally peaceful, and, you know, psychologically balanced. This is what we are trying. And because of that, so many students wish to come and get ad take admission in our uh, school, but we have limitation. The hostel need to be expanded. School has to be, uh, you know, expanded the buildings. So uh, today we are supporting nearly 1,000 students, maybe more than 1,000 students altogether. 800 students are studying in our main campus, and we have two more branches. In each branches around 100. <coughs> And we are supporting many senior students outside Ladakh, right? So how I am supporting? And this, this school and hostels were uh, conceived and built for those children from remote villages, you know, or the orphans or semi-orphans, or they may have parents, have many children, nobody is earning money from the family, nobody is going to school. These children are selected from those villages. So that means we have to provide most of them free. And how to, how to give them free? We have to pay the teacher's salary. 
we have to have bus and uniform and stationery and these food and other things, so many things. How we do? I'm a bhikkhu, I have no money. So I go around the world asking people to, can you please sponsor a child? Can you please sponsor a child? So many of them, most of them are sponsored. So if you people, there cannot be a greater service, greater, greater what I call compassion in action than helping a lovely girl or boy to have a good education where they can stand. This girl now who is in Chicago, we're sponsoring the education of some children in our hostel. Isn't it? It's a transformation. And then we started the first hostel for girls. You cannot believe those girls blind. They have created world record, friends, world record. Now she studied t up to 10th standard in our school. Then we have helped her to continue her study in Chandigarh and Delhi. She got master's degree from Delhi University. Now she is working in a bank in Delhi. And she travelled alone from Delhi to Ladakh. I cannot, difficulties. She travelled from Delhi to Chandigarh alone. And she participated in so many adventurous trips, rock climbing, cycling, swimming, boxing and other things, blind. So much uh, record, even Prime Minister of India mentioned her name in his talk on the Sunday. You know, isn't it amazing? Blind, totally blind, working in bank, and so many awards you received. And another fellow is working in multinational companies. <laughs> multinational companies working on also blind. So all this we were able to help and transform and transform thousands of life, the children, the disabled. We are also giving uh, special priority to the disabled people. We have Brother Charlie and some people, those who have visited our campus last summer have seen on wheelchair born. She, ca she cannot stand up. Brilliant. Brilliant. She's uh, sponsored by our uh, sister Ramona Lai, the wheelchair and other things, you know. So the uh, campus is already beautiful. Thousands of trees, apple, including apple, apricot, flowers have been planted. Uh, but we, we have still a lot more to be done. We really want to make the whole campus green, full of flowers, full of apple and apricot trees. And we want to see in the whole of Ladakh region, not a single physically challenged girls or boys are left out without education. We want to have all the physically, mentally challenged children to be brought to our campus, give the best possible education and become like these blind girls working in a bank. And we wish there's not a single child in the remote villages be left out without education, deprived of education. This is our wish. We wish that not a single elderly people in those harsh weather, you know, the elderly people in our home mostly come from the nomadic families on China borders. You know, nomadic family means no permanent house. Not like your house, like, you know, air condition, nothing. They live in a kind of tent. The tent also not so nice tent. And the winter time, temperature goes minus 20, 30, 30, 40. They live in tent. And when there is no heating system inside the tent, there's hardly any difference between temperature inside and outside the tent. People are both those elderly people. The biggest enemy of elderly people are the severe cold of winter, friends. So we wish not a single such elderly people, uncares, left out. We want to bring them. And to help with all the suffering humanities, all these people, to give them, you know, best possible comfort at the last part of their life. Uh, we cannot do this. We want to invite you to be part of this revolutionary uh, Buddhist program in Ladakh. Our organization is known as the uh, Socially Engaged Buddhist. Buddhism in action, compassion in action, compassion, meditation in actions. So a lot of good things are happening. Besides this, we are also working very hard 
you know, Ladakh alone, India alone, Asia alone cannot expect to live in peace and harmony without considering uh, the whole world. Today the whole world has become like a small village. Something happens, small things affect the other side of the world. Something happened in America immediately affects here. While we are trying to improve ourselves, you know, inwardly or spiritually, we also have to think of the whole world, pray for the world. So we've been working very hard for world peace, for religious harmony, for environment, uh, to promote peace in the world. So uh, time has come for us to friend, think globally, work globally also. Uh, America cannot think of living in peace and security without considering the peace and security in Europe. Europe cannot think of living in peace and security without considering the Asia. Asia cannot think of living in peace and harmony and prosperity without including America and Europe. Because the whole world is so strongly interconnected, interrelated, interdependent. So the great teachings of Buddha interdependent. So we also have to pray together for world peace. We cannot remain the spectator when millions of such innocent people, including children and mother, are brutally killed in this cruel war, Ukraine, Russia, and Israel and Palestine. They are all part of us. Whether we are American, European, Asian, Buddhist, Muslim, we are sharing the same planet. We, we are sharing one planet. We are living one, under one sun, one moon, one sky. We are breathing the same water, drinking the same water drinking the same water, breathing the same air. We also all have a responsibility. That's why this morning I was talking to our friends at Nalanda Center that all Nalandians must now think of become, think of taking a vow for Bodhisattva vow. I will tell the same thing. Time has come for Malaysian. You all have what you need. You don't need to struggle so much for how to get the two pieces of bread and butter for your survival, like other people in other countries. It is now for Malaysia, it's time to think higher globally for world peace, for harmony. You know, that will be great things and only Malaysian can do. I think I must be exceeding my time. Huh? Yes, yes. So, uh, shall we, shall we, can I have another five minutes? Only less than five minutes to do little metta bhavana meditation. Without metta bhavana meditation, all our program here in this hall may remain incomplete, friends. Just I was talking, we have to think about this. We all came and had a wonderful time. We are growing spiritually, but we also have to think about the whole world. Those who are less fortunate, this, those who are in great pain. Do we have a few minutes? Sir? Thank you so much. <laughs> <clears throat> With this, may I invite you to sit as comfortably as you can, as peacefully as you can, and as happily as you can. <clears throat> Before we proceed further, let us remind ourselves how fortunate we are, how lucky we are. We are blessed with the precious human life. We are blessed with the precious physical and mental health. We are blessed with the basic intelligence or education. We are blessed with the basic material requirement. We are blessed with the opportunity to learn and practice. <coughs> learn and practice the precious teachings of the Buddha. And anyone who sincerely, earnestly learn and practice the precious teachings of Buddha, he or she can bound to get enlightenment in this very lifetime if, were, if she or he wish so. Right now, at this moment, we who are sitting in this beautiful hall are blessed with all the favorable conditions, the required conditions to grow in Dhamma and to attain the internal bliss of Nibbana, my dears. By remembering, by remembering all the blessings we have, all the fortune we have, all the good karma we have, let us feel ourselves very happy, very fortunate. Let us fill our heart with all the love and compassion, all the love and compassion. 
Let this pure, universal, compassionate love overflow from our hearts. Let our hearts be the fountains of this pure, compassionate, universal love. And from the depth of the hearts which are overflowing with the universal, compassionate love, let us think of all our fellow human beings, fellow living beings who are sharing the same planets. Starting from our dearest and nearest one, maybe our beloved mother, beloved father, beloved brothers and sisters of the family, beloved wife, husband, beloved children, and other family members, other relatives, our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors, all those people, all the living beings in this area, in this province, in this country, in the neighboring countries, in the whole of Asia and Australia, the whole of Middle East, the whole of Europe and Africa, the whole of North and South America, the entire world, the entire universe. All human beings, all living beings, near or far, small or big, visible or invisible human beings or non-human beings, all those who live inside the earth, all those who live inside the water, all those who live on the surface of the earth, all those who live in space. All living beings, particularly all those who are in great pain and suffering. Friends, we, were, we who are sitting in this hall are some of the very fortunate human beings. There are millions and millions of people in such a great pain and suffering. War is going on, thousands and thousands of people are being killed in the cruel war, including mother and children. Thousands and thousands are suffering from hunger, suffering from thirst, thousands and thousands are suffering from unjust and unfair treatment, thousands and thousands are suffering from incurable diseases, thousands and thousands of people are crying and waiting for death. All the suffering people are our brothers and sisters, my dears. We also have suffered like them before. If we do not wake up soon, we will suffer like them again. Realizing all the suffering people, friends, let us from the depth of our hearts, with all the love and compassion, let us hear their cries, let us feel their pain. And from the depth of our hearts, with all the love and compassion, let us pray for them. Let us wish them free from all the sufferings. May all suffering beings be free from all kinds of suffering. May all of them come in contact with the noble teachings of the enlightened one. May pure Dhamma, pure love, compassion, wisdom grow in their hearts. May all of them progress on the path of liberation, liberation from the will of existence, liberation from the darkness of the samsara, liberation from the bondages of samsara. May all of them sooner or later attain the eternal bliss of Nibbana. Until that time, may all of them live peacefully, happily, harmoniously, friendly, loving and serving, caring and sharing with each other without hurting and harming each other. May the love and the light of the pure love and compassion shine brightly in the hearts and minds of everybody in every corner of the world, dispelling the darkness of ignorance. May this world become like heaven. May all of us experience divine life here, here and now. May all enjoy real peace, real happiness, real harmony. May all living beings be well and happy. May all living beings be well and happy. May all living beings be well and happy. Sabbitiyo vivajantu sabbaro govina sato Mate bhavantu antarayo sukhi digayu ko bhava Bhavatu sabba manghalam rakantu sabba devata Sabba buddha nubhavena Sabha Dhamma Nubhavena Sabha Sangha Nubhavena 
सदासुती भवन तुती